Hello everyone, welcome to FECast. Today we've got for you new set spoilers and a patch to break down, a balance patch. Let's go. Hello everyone, my name is Sunnyvale, I've got fellow Worlds competitor Stormblessed with me, and welcome to FECast. Today we're going to be talking about the patch that released uh, a few days ago at this point, it was February 1st was when it went live, uh, but we are going to break it down. And we've got five spoilers to go over, but they're all legendaries, so that should be a lot of fun. Alright, how are you doing Stormblessed? I'm doing really well. The The new set drops one week from today. It's already happening. Very surprising how quick it's it just top, popped out of nowhere. It's like, boop, and it's like, oh, it's here. So um, should be a lot of fun. I'm hoping there's a lot of cool new cards, and I'm excited to just jump right into it. Well, I mean, that is Direwolf's MO, so I, I don't know if we can be too surprised at this point. I like how uh, e no news dropped as we were recording uh, last time, which is over <laughs> this past weekend. But like immediately after listening to our episode, after hearing that there was a, a balance patch, like a lot of our analysis, you just take it and throw it out the window because <laughs> things change. So uh, thanks, yeah. Direwolf, for always being on top of that. So before we specifically talk about patch, I'd just like to bring up Valkyrie Warp as a mechanic. Discuss it very briefly for no for no reason at all. So my opinion on Valkyrie Warp has sort of changed slightly. I think it's still pretty silly mechanic. But after playing with it for a bit, you know, I think it has played better than it looked because a lot of the cards are not very swingy. The differential between warping with Valkyrie Warp and playing it normally isn't extremely high. Yes, you get a slight benefit. You obviously get the card off the top. Like, you know, Deathwing has its effect. Tower gives you the double activate. But, you know, it's not like, it's not like this the most major swing ever. So with all that being said, Sonny, I'd like to discuss heavy artillery with you. <laughs> Just one thing I want to say about Valkyrie Warp before we go on to these cards. I actually, in, in last month's league, I actually beat a Valkyrie Warped Styers Tower on turn four. Um, I felt pretty good about that one. I don't remember <laughs> if I let them get the, the unit or not, but I felt pretty good. Like when you're facing down a Warped Styers Tower on turn four, uh, in limited, and you can come out of it uh, victorious. That that feels pretty good. Anyway, uh, continue. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so yeah. But, I mean, that's part of my point. Is it's obviously better to warp it than not because you know getting the card on the top of your deck for free, getting the double activate. It's all very powerful things. But it's not you know completely backbreaking, super swingy. So heavy artillery for those of you who don't know was a uh, four fire fire five one overwhelm relic weapon and it Valkyrie warp. Play a three three whale driver on a unit in play. So. If you have a Valkyrie, and if it's Line Axe especially, you get to deal 9 damage, you get to make Line Axe into a 6-6 six, six, flyer, and you get a 5-1 Overwhelm. So I think this is probably a good change to make the card again less swingy, so that way it's still a powerful effect, but it no longer just completely destroys the game state that it's in. So Heavy Artillery, instead of playing the Rail Driver, now you just draw the Rail Driver. So I think this is a fine change. It cuts the swinginess of it and you know puts it in line with the other Valkyrie Warp cards. I mean, I'll be honest with you. The change I want to see from Valkyrie Warp is just have all of those cards deleted yeah. from the game, or at least all the Valkyrie <laughs> Warp text deleted from the game. Just make it warp. Yeah. It, uh, well, I mean, I, I think I would be okay if... No, I think I think I just want all these cards out of here. I <laughs> There's nothing I like about it. Actually, actually, actually you, know, you know what I kind of wish how Valkyrie Warp worked? I wish it had warp normally, but then if you had a Valkyrie in play, you got the secondary effect. Although that might be too good, obviously, with like Lord Styr's Tower just always being able to warp it. So maybe that's why they didn't do it. But like, I don't, it's so it's so weird, you know, having the Valkyrie in play that it can't warp normally. It's just it's just a clumsy mechanic. Yeah, let's talk about a change that I think everyone is happy to see. The Speaking Circle now has three durability instead of four, and now kills enemy sites at the end of each turn rather than the enemy player can't have a site. Um, so the worst feeling in card games is playing a card and it doing nothing. The second worst feeling is not being able to play a card, and that's what the Speaking Circle did to other sites. We talked about it uh, in conjunction of the, uh, the new fire site that's coming out of Buried Memories. But definitely happy to see that there's a change and it's going to make the speaking circle, it's, it's still going to be good, but it's not going to be as frustrating as previously because you could still get one part of the agenda out of your sights if you, there's an opposing speaking circle and you can use your speaking circles to kill your opponents. 
yeah, I think that's the biggest change here is just you know, it's not it's no longer first to play speaking circle. In some sense, it is second to play speaking circle because now that it has three durability, I think maybe Daryl could have left it at four for a bit, but also, you know, you don't want to nerf a card too many times, so maybe it's better to bite the bullet now than have to risk nerfing it a second time. But um, I would have liked to see it at four, but you know, the second circle now in some respects can be more powerful because the thing is, is that there's actually a fair number of things that deal three damage, you know, like vicious overgrowth. I got into a slight discussion with uh, Days Undoing on the main Discord about it, and uh, they provided a significant list of cards where the second circle now has a higher chance of killing the first one, even so you might have to use it as removal. I like that, you know, again, mirror matches are no longer super frustrating. You can't slam circle and then the opponent's like, well, guess I just have three dead cards in hand. So big fan of this change. Kind of wish it had four abilities still, but I overall I think the speaking circle deserved a change to make it a more fun play pattern. Yeah, there really aren't that many cards that can deal with sites at, that cost three or less. There aren't many things that deal direct damage to sites, but I suppose you do get nine looks at it. So we'll see how often that comes up where you can actually spend all your power in order to play your own speaking circle and then be able to kill theirs before the end of the turn. There's actually more than you think. There's a, you know, like at any cost, opens technique, both techniques now do circle. We'll get that later. Overgrowth, at any cost, pillage, pyrotech explosion. There's at least like seven to ten in expedition alone. Oh, that is that is more than I would think. Yeah, especially because, you know, the, we'll wait later, but there is a slight buff that also does uh, kill a site. But anyway, so next card, uh, Invasive Creeper was a three cost two two Mandrake. It was the fate draw card. If you have a Mandrake and if you, if you activate an ultimate, all your Mandrakes got plus one attack and lifesteal. It used to be a two two. Now it's a two one. I think this is fine. I think Mandrakes were too good. This one was the best in the cycle of fate draw card if you have X unit because it was just, you know, had the easiest activation other ability. I think all the other cards in the cycle are XXs, and this is not an XX anymore, so aesthetically it's kind of disappointing, but um, this is fine. Yeah, I don't really have much to say about this one. They also knocked Vine Tangler's ultimate to 9 from 7. I didn't feel like Mandrakes particularly needed another nerf, but, I mean, if it's everywhere, you know, make the people happy. Sure, it's kind of whatever. I've heard people been like, they've hurt draft for constructed and i'm like it's probably still a good card in draft having a four cost two four and a three three is probably a still really good synergy and you know still can have like an activation but the real key what you guys have been waiting for us to talk about in this discussion of the balance patch changes are the buffs so we've had three wait wait, wait. you missed buffed. the biggest one wait what's no, going no, on no th th those aren't important we'll start with the buffs first then we'll get to the oh. then we'll get to the, the boring part okay so we've had three cards that were buffed it seems that uh, Primal is the faction of cards that get the Bold Adventurer treatment. It is the <laughs> faction of two cost two two legendaries that eventually become two cost two three legendaries. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> Matriarch Zende was the one that says Mandrakes have weird things. Summon, give a Mandrake plus one attack and flying. And then if a Mandrake kills an enemy unit, you get to turn into a Balm and draw it. And Balm was like two cost, give a unit plus a health and then draw a card. And it was a 2-2, two, two, now it's a 2-3. I think this is a fine change. I think the card has cool text, and uh, that's fine. Is 2-3, like, a good body size? I guess it's better against aggro, because, like, as a 2-drop, that's still under-costed. That's not what you want it to be. I mean, a 2-3 is a lot better than a 2-2, two, two, let me tell you. Yeah, I mean, it blocks, like, 2-1s and 2-2s. Two, the problem is we have two cost 4-4s four now. You know, we have yeah. Ganner David... We have Maveloff Huntress, and now people are playing Maveloff Elite, and we have Shock Troops, which are also just, like, two cost, <laughs> one cost, four fours, so. Yeah, so, like, it still just doesn't feel like relevant body size, and that's just yeah. something that's always been necessary for two drops. Even even ones with powerful abilities like um, Dusk Hunter, I think, the one that grants Nightfall and uh, inspires your units to be have Berserk. Dusk Raider? Is yes. that it? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, like... That card has not really stuck because it's not big enough. It doesn't attack for enough. It doesn't deal three damage, which is just what I feel like two drops have to do. I mean, either way, I think it's fine to see buffs like this. I like seeing cards get buffed and, you know, maybe it makes it more attractive to people if having fun Mandrake decks. So next card, I've seen uh, Doc on his article say that this is a super impactful buff. And there are other people who say that this is the most important flavor text Daryl has ever given of all time. I'm more on the flavor text side than the buff side, but um, we have a Skimmer Wrangler. So 
You guys might not know what that card is because it's a card that doesn't see very much play. It is three primal primal for a four three explorer soldier relevant play, uh, unit types with overwhelm. And it has summon. Stun an enemy unit with flying. It remains stunned forever as long as Team Ranger is in play. Now it stuns two enemy units with flying. Double the stun flying units. I think this is kind of flavor text, although, you know, maybe Doc is right. It seems like flavor text to me. I mean, like, if you get value off of it, that's pretty good. Yeah. Like, a 4-3, uh, big body for a 3-drop that keeps something stunned for as long as it's in play, that's value. If you get even more value than that, great, but I don't know that you can count on it. What two flyers <laughs> are you planning on stunning with this? Lord is... Sire's Tower. Gear to those oh, two bad okay. hit the tower, boom. So. I don't know. I mean, that that could be what it's trying to go for. This could just be a buff. Daryl saying, hey, hey, community, this card's good and you should play it. There, there have been a couple of these, like the snowball one, the one made a snowman with the Vietis. They're like, hey, oh, yeah. you guys should play this. I mean, this card does seem like it has a powerful effect and just hasn't seen much play. So maybe that's what Daryl was doing. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. That would make sense. And this card does seem like a card that should <laughs> see play based on its rate. Yeah, so the next card is one of those that I was saying... Um, Changes makes the second circle being able to kill the first circle. Opum's technique is the Sentinel technique in Praxis. These are the cards that have three modes. And it's damage dealing mode used to read deal five damage to a multi-faction enemy. Now it deals five damage to a faction list or multi-faction enemy. So this kills Dragon Simulacre from Cast Iron Forge or it kills Speaking Circles. So what do you think about this change, Sonny? Yeah, I mean... I think they just wanted to give us more play against Speaking Circle. Clearly, that was an issue before, and I think everyone felt it. Yeah. Like, there aren't that many colorless cards that you care about. Like, maybe the Dragon Similar Acre, but, like, I don't know that you're trying to answer it with one cost spell at that point in the game. But it just seems, like, very targeted toward the Speaking Circle, and... Yeah, I, I guess that's good. You you have more ways to combat it because that was clearly an issue before this patch. I kind of wish you said deal five damage to a not mono faction enemy, but um, but yeah. So okay, now it's time to get to the important part of of the patch notes, the very important thing. So we've had some bug fixes. It turns out call on allies, a line of test react to clear the way. Now interact properly with cards that want to count amplifications, and the speaking circle will play display of creation and display of destruction. So that's great news for people who want to play those four cards. Sonny, what do you think of these of these remaining additional fixes before we move on? Um, yeah, I'm just going to uh, <laughs> forget. I'm just going to ignore your question and get on to the part that people actually want to hear about. Silex has received a buff. I've been calling for this for a long a time. Um, I am all aboard the buff train hey, and oh, oh. I am happy that this happened. So yeah, yeah. the five Silexes that exist, Rakano, Skycrag, Elysian, Xenon, and Argentport Silex now are depleted until you have triple fire or triple justice for example in the Rakano silex and if you have both you get your treasure trove previously you only needed two of each faction for it to be undepleted and or get a treasure trove so uh i i'm glad i think silexes were just like way too good for a long time uh, although to be fair like uh i <laughs> i played huru kira which didn't care about silexes uh at worlds so like clearly it wasn't oh an absolute necessity but just like Silexes were just too good. They were just too good. It was outrageous. Like you would get into mirror matches of the uh, vision value decks where the person who just played more Silexes would win because they're just that good. So I am I am all aboard this train. So I think the big winner from the Silex nerf is going to be decks that don't play Silexes. I know that that sounds like a, a hot take, but you know, who here probably is a big winner here because it didn't play Silex. Factions that have paintings, Woo, their stock just rose dramatically. It's like their GameStop. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so Silex has got, got the nerf fat. Vision, I'm not sure if it can survive this. Vision really relied on having this card draw. Part of disappointment is probably because this enabled not primal uh, control decks, which was really interesting that we really haven't seen that type of archetype before, but now we probably might not see it again. Um, Big deal, Elysian gets a huge nerf out of this. I don't think Krull Elysian can be built the same way anymore. If you look at Doc's article, you saw that he still wanted to keep the Krull and has just the most embarrassing power base of all time, playing <laughs> Crest, Banner, and Seat like it's 2017. But um, I personally think that maybe you just forego Krull and keep the Crests in and add Insignias back into the deck. 
we'll see which which build of Elysian makes it if Elysian can survive. It probably will because Elysian is a powerful deck in its core, but especially in Expedition. Expedition, this matters in some respects more than Throne outside of toning down Elysian and maybe killing Vision as a deck. But in Expedition, the factions with Silexes, that was like, they had two duels. It was like that and Seeds. So the, suddenly, you know, Sea Vow painting is much, much better. The Elysian Expedition is probably just neutered hard. Like Expedition Elysian has got to be in rough shape right now. This is a huge, huge change. I know I was making a joke about it earlier, but this is one of the biggest changes to Eternal in a very long time. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, um, well, in Throne at least, I think that normally you're just not going to play Silexes unless you're playing a two-faction deck or you're playing a three-faction deck that just only has a very light splash. Yeah, I agree with that. But you're absolutely right. In Expedition, where there are fewer duels, that's a really big deal because you were relying on your Silexes to be undepleted on turn three, and they're probably not going to be more often now. Yeah, I think I think Combray stocks go way up. And if you're a three-faction deck, that in, in the expedition specifically, if you're a three faction deck that doesn't align on the Silexes, you know, before it was like, oh, you want to align on the Silexes, right? That's why Vision was so good. Uh, now you want to be the opposite. You don't want to align on the Silexes. So yep. this kind of gives more game to the factions with our uh, unit types, which is probably a good thing Daryl wants, you know, trying to promote the other five three faction pairings. Yeah. The aftermath of the Silex nerf, in many respects, cannot be understated, right? You have clear winners, like Peru's probably the biggest winner, uh, because they, they aren't touched, and, you know, some of their bad matchups have been touched. That's always, you know, a positive, right? If the deck you are playing <laughs> doesn't get nerfed, and the other decks did get nerfed, well, suddenly you're in a better spot. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to see. I'm, I'm very curious. I think that in two-faction decks, Silexes will still be quite powerful. I think people are overrating the nerf slightly i think that you know silexes are still good cards and you know you should still be playing them just not really in three faction decks you know you gotta put more effort in your silexes but they're honestly they're still worth putting effort into because <laughs> they were really absurd before they're still probably good now yeah i definitely agree one more thing about this is i totally called this i don't know if oh, i was yeah. the first one to call for silex nerfs but we're gonna have to go back to the tape because I think the first time I saw Silexes, I was like, these cards should be nerfed. I mean, I think it was literally the very first thing in the uh, spoiler review. I think the very first thing somebody said when he saw the Silexes was, these cards are going to get nerfed. I've always said, when you have a power that, you know, produces power, adds influence, is undepleted, and does something else, it's pretty insane and that's exactly what these silexes do i actually wouldn't be surprised if these end up overtaking insignias as the most powerful power i don't think so right now but i think that this is a like these cards I, i'm worried about the power level i think they might need to be nerfed at some point i mean i don't know i don't know really how how you nerf it without making it always depleted or like i mean you can't like if you increase the cost of treasure trove to three one you can't do that because that's a fundamental card in the game at this point oh i'm the influence requirement if you like oh you make it like triple three time, times triple time. sure yeah sure that would, that would be a way to do it yeah it's, it's... <laughs> have fun with these they're going to be great and uh yeah <laughs> we'll see if they get nerfed <laughs> like i'm predicting it took a while but sunny got there you know at the same time though sunny i think i think in our cards to get nerfed from empire glass you know we, we i think i think we all thought speaking circle might take the hit but none of us predicted Invasive Creeper would be the one to get nerfed. <laughs> yeah, geez. I, I don't think I did too well on those predictions. We'll have to go back and see. I think, it, like like with the Silex nerf, you need time to see these yes. nerfs come to fruition. You know, yeah, yeah. like Direwolf gives us the toys unless there's something really broken about it. They're going to let us play with them the way they were published before they take them away, wrench them from our hands. So uh, we'll we'll have to revisit that episode and maybe other times where I've called for nerfs or <laughs> something like that. So anyway, uh, let's talk about some of the new cards and potentially talk about if any of these are going to get nerfed. I, I don't think so, but let's talk about the new cards that they spoiled from Buried Memories. The first one is Hephos, Reach Captain. It's a one cost, one two flying for time justice and primal it has amplify two stun an enemy unit or play a plus two plus two weapon on hephos or draw a random sigil from your deck so another cool hit for genitor dovid i'm not so sure about this one it's its rate seems pretty bad for me but what do you think stormblast 
I think this card is incredible. I think this card is super powerful, and I love it. And I think it's just probably going to be one of the best cards released in this new mini set. We'll, we'll, we'll see it. We'll get to uh, ranking the cards later, but I think this card is one of the best in its cycle. Just in general, I love its design as well, because I think that it can be a really solid role player helping you reach, you know, my, my favorite term, critical mass in building decks. Uh, it fits into, you know, so many archetypes if you want it to. It can be in a soldier archetype. It could be a multi-faction archetype. It can be a flying archetype. Oh, the archetype that cares about one drops. Amplify synergy, weapon synergy, stunning synergy, ramp synergy, and, you know, even like old memes like Chalice could, you know, maybe have some fun taking it out with a new toy. So I think this card is really cool on a design level because it just uh, kind of is a solid linchpin, like a, like a nice pillar to prop up a bunch of potentially decent synergy decks because it just does so many different things at a good rate. Uh, I mean, I think the car is just super good on, like, you know, on every axis. Uh, now, mind you, you're probably only going to, you're most likely not going to play it for one, but if you really need to play it for one, as, you know, as a super, super tempo extra blocker versus your aggro deck, you know, you'll play it for one. It'll either be overplayed at one or criminally underplayed at one. I haven't decided which it will be, but, um, you know, there'll, there'll be times you got to play it for one, and knowing that will be good, too. It just does a lot. Like, if you think about it this way, it's like an Amber Acolyte, but has flying, which already makes it way better than Amber Acolyte. But instead of doing that, you know, if you already have the power, it can be a, just a 3-4 flyer, which is really good. Or it can stun in a unit. Or if you have play 5, you know, you can do multiple things. One of the reasons I think it's so good is, A, it's also, a, suddenly I forgot that it's a soldier as well, a soldier bird. Not that the bird part's super relevant right now, but the soldier tag is super relevant. You know, call on allies. It can be fetched off Janitor Dovid. Uh, Crown Watch Press Gang is a soldier. This card's a soldier and a one drop. You know, you can kind of put them together. This is card just super flexible. It just amplifies, right? So anything that requires an amplify synergy, it just works on. But also, you know, drawing sigils helps you to amplify more cards. You know, being able to put more power into play means that you can amplify more things for more, which again is just what you want in a deck that's potentially working on amplify. So I think that it just does a lot for very little investment. So I think if it's going to see play, it's going to see play in like a three faction uh, Majestic Skies deck. And there will have use as being a one cost, one two flyer. I think outside of that, I'm really not that excited about it. Yes, it does cost the same amount as Amber Acolyte for a similar effect. But the thing is, Amber Acolyte can also help you fix. You need your three factions before you can play this. The other thing is that, like, even if you can make it big, right, like three, four flyer for three or five, six flyer for five or seven, eight flyer for seven, um, it doesn't have any abilities outside of flying when you play it. So, like, I'm not too thrilled about this. It's going to be difficult to find a deck for it. Once you do find a deck that, like, wants enough of man i think you just want it as a one two flyer and as a three four flyer I, like i think those are the two modes that more often than not are going to be used and maybe just to stun something at the end of the game if you're like attacking with flyers for the win maybe i'm just like old man sunny vale and super pessimistic about every new card spoiled now but i'm just i'm just not really that feeling it with this one you know, you bring up a good point. Being three factions is a downside, especially in the post Silex world that we all must live in now, the nightmare scenario of not having fun Silexes to play with. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I think you're underestimating its flexibility slightly, you know, being flexible and being a decent rate if, you know, you're not, you know, trying to invest in its other alternative modes, I think is just going to be a good solid role player, right? It's not going to be like super busted card in any deck, but you're also never going to be dissatisfied to draw it, you know, unless you don't have the influence, obviously. Uh, but that applies to all of these cards. <laughs> the next card on our list is Gren Iron Martyr. And Gren talks like this. I am the best Grenadin. Um, <laughs> I, I, so, 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 so Daryl was putting out lore articles for each one of these. So there are five lore articles featuring each hero. Gren is the only lore article I've read. And it was very funny. Like, you know, they're, they're exploring a booby trap temple. And then they're like, Gren, you almost killed yourself, but you're so small that you walked under the booby trap wire. Um, and Gren's like, of course I did, because I am the best Grenadin adventurer in the world. Um, and so that was funny. But anyways, uh, unfortunately for you, Gren, you are not the best Grenadin adventurer. You are three fire primal shadow for a 1-1. One -one. Grenadin cultist. Uh, Gren can't block. And if it and Gren has Intomb, draw a card. Your other Grenadin get plus one attack. 
increase the damage of each spell in your hand by one. I'm not a big fan of this card. It's, it's you know, for the same price, you can get a 3-4 Hephos. For the same price, you can, you know, you can play Dark Wisp and sacrifice it with Bust. <laughs> uh, it can't block, which is a way that things die. So it says your other granted to get plus one attack. It's not even your other units. If it was your other units, you know, it car- your heart wants to work with Totas. You know, you want to play it with Kato, and you want to play it with, you know, Kindling Carver. We play with those cards, you know, it can't even buff those cards. And so, like, you need to have cards that deal damage in your hand. Like, this card works with, like, Display of Menace and, like, nothing else because Display of Menace can both get its pull off its Entomb ability and also benefit from its Entomb ability. It's just, it's a weird card that just seems like it costs too much, and the fact that it can't block is really brutal. Yeah, you need to have the sacrifice outlet ready to go because your opponent's not going to block this, right? If you attack, <laughs> they're just going to be like, okay, whatever, take one. Um, and like the effect isn't even that good. It basically is a Dark Wisp. I don't give a whole ton of stock to other Grandin <laughs> being plus one attack or uh, damage of your spell increased by one. That like That's not where the power of the deck is. The power of the deck is being able to just like keep on grinding and drawing cards and, you know, use all of your power every single turn and... I just don't think that the size of Grenadines matter, and certainly not the damage of your spell if you're jumping through hoops in order to get it. So, so the thing I like about it is I like that it has a sort of flexibility to it that can fit into a variety of different decks or potentially try to prop up new decks. Where you know it, it it's a dark wisp that you know kind of do have a go wide strategy and also can kind of try building this like spell damage based you know, sacrifice deck, which would be an interesting deck we haven't seen before, you know, with cards like Display of Menace. So it's like, you know, it's a lot like Hephos in that regard, where it's kind of like it's trying to synergize with a bunch of things, you know. But the fact that it can't block, if it could block, then I could be like, oh, you could kind of make like an interesting spell damage deck with it, but it just can't block. And the fact that it's your other Grenadine, not your other units, means that the fact that you sacrifice it and you can't pump your Kato and your Tota just is really disappointing. Yeah. So... And something I want to bring up is that Hephos is flexible in how you can play with it once you're in game, whereas Gren is like flexible in how you can build your deck. And you can't really take advantage of all aspects of it the same that well. Whereas Hephos can really adapt to the situation, like if you need to stun things or if you need something big or if you need, you know, a couple more sigils or something, that's something you can do. But Gren, your line is written for you and the effect that you get isn't super focused and it doesn't like lend to its own deck so that's a very good point on flexibility of the card where hephos has flexibility for deck building and for gameplay especially for gameplay gren doesn't yeah all right i'm i'm actually excited about the next card volk the art of forge it's three cost fire time justice five three overwhelm endurance uh it's a sentinel explorer and it has entomb play volk's heart volk's heart is a relic that says pay three and sacrifice volk's heart and another relic to play volk from the void with plus two plus two so you play this on turn three you attack make your opponent use removal spell um late in the game when you have like lots of power stones or what have you and uh you just don't have much to do you pay three you get volk back it's now a seven five with endurance and overwhelm and then the next time you get it back it's a uh, it's a nine five. So I, the rate is good on this. I don't love that it has three health, but it hits hard. It comes back and it's uh, it's efficient. So I like this card quite a bit. Yeah, I think this card is great. Endurance and overwhelm is an actually powerful set of abilities. It means that it can attack well, and the fact that it's also big stats means that it can block well. Like Kira showed that endurance is a really good both on aggression and defense in many ways because allows you to attack through and allows you to block. And the fact that it has Overwhelm with its five attack means that it, you know, has benefits from, say, you know, Opum, the Gem Lord, giving it plus five, plus five, you know, is really good if you're you know, already as Overwhelm. Yeah, also, like, if you just have it in the late game, it's huge, then chump blocking isn't effective against it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, I mean, Overwhelm, Overwhelm cannot be understood, especially with its, you know, recursion ability to giving it more attack. Uh, on top of that, it works with other card, one of my favorite cards that hasn't seen much play, but it could see a lot with this card, Controlled Demolition, giving this card double damage and regen, turns into a double damage 5-3 Endurance Overwhelm regen that, you know, because of how Eternal works, it keeps the abilities. So if it dies, you bring it back, suddenly now it's a 7-5 Endurance Overwhelm double damage regen, and you get to redo the regen, so you get a second double dip of the regen ability. So there are some potentially powerful synergies here. I think people are maybe slightly 
in their theory crafting, putting too many relics in there. I don't think you need that many relics to make Volt great, uh, honestly. Um, you know, you can have, like, your Amber Locks, whatever, but honestly, you can either, A, just recur this without that, say, like, uh, restorative process, just bringing it back out naturally from the Void. But also, if you just play two Volks, you'll get two Volks hearts, and you can just sack one of the Volks hearts to a Volk and bring back one Volk. So, like, it fuels itself. The second copy enables you to get back a free unit. On top of that, the fact that Volk's heart puts it into play directly and not to your hand even just makes it super efficient. That, you know, you, reading this card, I assumed that it just brought it back to your hand with, you know, pay three and sacrifice Volk's heart, another relic, to put it in your hand with plus two, plus two. So it's like, oh, that's, I mean, it's good, but like you have to pay six to put it back into play. No, no, no. You're just going to put it back into play. This card, just like uh, with Hephos, you know, this card has a a ton of synergy potential with building some sort of like more aggressive sentinels deck building a relic based you know deck building you know it's an explorer and a sentinel so it also can fit into relic reanimator on both ends where you can reanimate it with the relic reanimation spell and you can also exhaust it to the relic reanimation spell to <laughs> reanimate a second sentinel so this card is is phenomenal yeah looking forward to this one the cards that combo with themselves I don't know if I actually like that, but I think it's nifty. <laughs> I, I think I don't like that. Like, <laughs> is it just free value? Like, if you if you're playing with yeah, it's relics, just or you just don't value. have any relics in play, it's just free value, right? You know, just sacrifice two Volks hearts to one Volk heart and just get back a free Volk. Like, that's just free, right? And then you play Restorate a yeah. process and you pull out a Volk heart and a Volk from your void a second time. Uh, notably, I keep mentioning this card, Restorate a process. For those of you who don't know, that is. Two in a time for a spell that says draw a sentinel and a relic from your void, which can pull out both Volk and his heart. All right, let's talk about the next one. This one's an interesting one. Eight cost, eight, eight, Irid, the Drifting Song. It is a time primal shadow card. It is in the factions of Mandrakes, and it's a Mandrake bard of all things. When Irid attacks, your Mandrakes get plus one attack, flying, endurance, and quick draw. And Tomb put nine copies of Urid into your deck. I'm not quite sure what to think about this one. I feel like costing eight, you kind of got to reanimate it. But if you're playing an, a Mandrake deck, you have a lot of small cards that you don't really want to reanimate. Uh, if you can attack with it with a board of Mandrakes, you probably just kill them. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Stormblast, do you have any good applications with this card? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you discard and you play Shoal Strings, you pull out two Mandrakes, and then you wait a turn. You have, that's probably the best application for is like near perfect imitation. Because your permutation differs from Grasping at Shadows and Shoal Stirrings by the fact that when you use near perfect imitation, you can attack immediately. So this allows Urid to attack immediately to get its attack boost off. It has it has a weird entomb. So the the this card this card is so I have to, I mean I want to say it's like bad because it's like it's like a, it's a, it's a meme to your card. You know it's gonna be meme, but I can't imagine it's gonna be good because like its entomb is incredibly awkward if you're cheating it into play. Cause can you can you imagine if you like cheat you're in the play for five power you have no other power in hand and then you, you dies your opponent's just like I'll just kill it and then you have you <laughs> shuffle nine copies of this into your deck it's like the reverse wasteland broker where instead of shuffling good cards in your deck you're shuffling unplayable cards in your deck so on that axis it's in tomb can be a massive downside uh, if you can get this thing destiny though you're just popping off right that's the dream. <laughs> You know, you give it destiny, they kill it, then you just draw a nine more, and you're just like, oh, we in the value wars! Um, <laughs> I expect we'll see, like, a uh, highlight video from Loco Pojo playing Crown of Possibilities, and then next turn top decking Urid, and then they're just, you know, the happiest person in the world. I mean, that'll be fun to see, you know, because then it dies, and the next turn they draw, like, nine more of them, and it's just really fun. But, uh, yeah, I'm not the most excited by this card. I think it's going to be a meme... And not a meme that I necessarily will enjoy, although I will be interested to see if it can work out. Well, near perfect imitation and the Mandrake uh, reanimator card, Shoal Stirrings, it, that, that is pretty interesting. You can either get this into play. I guess it doesn't have flying on defense. I don't know how relevant that is. But... Well, it does actually. It ha if you, well, if you play near perfect imitation and you attack, it has endurance, so it will defend with flying. Oh, it's permanent. So your Mandrakes get those yeah, yeah. abilities permanently. Okay, okay. So that's sort of where the Entomb is that, you know, it dies and then you draw it again and it already has the Flying Endurance Quick Draw and you attack it and then it becomes a 10-8. Yeah, I, I think I can see this working out. I think that it's going to take some creativity to find the right numbers because, like, it's the type of thing where you can't go too far in the reanimation thing because you need cards in play in order to benefit from it. 
but I don't know, maybe just like, you know, having a random card in play and then playing near perfect imitation and then all of a sudden getting a nine eight flying endurance quick draw maybe that's good enough you excavate or you second sight this at the top of your deck and then you play the three cost destiny card to give it destiny and then that's <laughs> how you give it destiny because you're already playing a bunch of like mandrakes anyways so then those put the units in play for that weird destiny card it's genius sunny I'm telling you, it's genius. That's actually kind of interesting because previously the Destiny card wasn't good enough because at that price point, you could just play your reanimation spell. But since this makes copies of it and puts it into the deck, then you get those cards having Destiny and then you're really going You get a bunch of late game value. Although notably, putting nine copies into your deck is also very random. Uh, It's not nine copies in the top half of your deck. It's nine copies in your deck. I guess... It's sort of like a more random version of Scorpion Traps. Uh, those put five copies in the top 20 cards of your deck. And this is nine copies in the top, let's say, 50 cards of your deck, or 40 even. Uh, yeah. Which makes it more random than Scorpion Trap. And if you ever play with Scorpion Trap, you'll know that it's good, but the randomness can be very brutal on either side. Yeah, well, it does make it so that you're three times as likely, roughly, three times as likely to draw this card than any other uh, card in your deck. The, the next card on the list, the last card in the cycle, is uh, in many ways sort of the most consistent card in the cycle. Uh, no, nah, Hevo's probably the most consistent. but uh, Well, not the most consistent, but like the most reliable in some respects. Uh, Dishro, Conqueror, is 6, Fire, Justice, Shadow, for a 3-5 Valkyrie Warrior with Flying and Charge. And when it attacks, each enemy unit gets minus 1, minus 1 until your next turn. So immediately the most... Uh, obvious comparison is Black Sky Harbinger. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, definitely. I don't think this is as good as Black Sky Harbinger because you don't uh, gain life immediately and you don't have it back as a big lifesteal blocker. And it's smaller, of course. But if these factions need a Black Sky Harbinger, it could actually be pretty good. Like Black Sky Harbinger is a card that its its power level depends on what the other cards in the format are. And this is going to be very similar. Um, If there are a lot of X ones, it can be absolutely backbreaking. Otherwise, it's it's a big flyer, but also an expensive one. Um, Ultimately, I think this is not as good as like Rezon. But I don't know, like relevant. I guess Rezon's also a a Valkyrie. But I don't know. I I think that this could see play, but I'm not holding my breath for Decro. Yeah, Rezon is also an expedition, notably, and that card hasn't seen any play. That being said, this card in a three-faction deck is easier to play than Rezon. I believe Rezon is Fire, Fire, Justice, Justice, right? It's double Rakano. Um, yeah. W- yeah, so this card in a three-faction deck would be easier to play. Uh, I think Black Sky Harbinger would probably be very good in Expedition if it was an Expedition. Uh, so, you know, but it's not, right? So this card could still be de- good enough. And, um, I mean, it does. It has an effect. It has, you know, relatively consistent effect. It, it's got the what we wish Tell it had. Uh, where Tell it only works until the end of your turn, but if Tell it was until the end of the opponent's turn, it would be uh, it would be a lot more interesting of a card. Yeah, it's just it's just a little bit awkward in, in many ways. Yeah, like imagine playing this against a control deck. You play your three five <laughs> flying charge for six, and then you attack. You deal them three, and then you just have something that attacks for three. Like that's not very spectacular. I mean, it kills Speaking Circle, I guess. All right, that's, that's something. That is true, and uh, like I think very relevant. But man, I would love to see yeah. this as a four or five at least. Yeah, it's a little bit underwhelming. Okay, I before we get back to this card for a second, I'd like to just you know make something aware that you will never be able to un- be unaware of. So Hephos is uh you know if you look at the card, it's you know it goes Time Justice Primal, right? Those are those are its three icons. It goes in that order as you know they as it should, but its Amplify ability. Has you know it's got three parts right because it's a three faction card. It's got the primal mode with stunning a unit. It's got the justice mode with playing a, a weapon on it. And it's got the sigil mode, which is the time unit. Its amplify text is in primal justice time order, where it's it's a faction icons at the top are in time justice primal order. You're welcome, listeners, for any of you that care about you know aesthetics like that. I'm sorry, listeners. I couldn't stop him from saying it. I have failed <laughs> you all. <laughs> Now that you have seen it, you cannot unsee it for those of you who are in of that mindset. I am cursed by this knowledge, and now so are all of you. I, I don't think I will ever notice that at all. But I don't know. Maybe two weeks from now, I'll be like, Stormblast, what have you done to me? You're not, you are not the target audience for that comment. Anyways, back to Dishro. 
I think it's very middling of the road as far as the cycle goes. Like, it might be a solid role player in a Valkyrie deck, but it also just might fall by the wayside. Yep. Uh, okay, Sonny, if you were to rate all of these cards, if you were to put them in an order from, you know, best to worst, what would your order be for these five? Uh, I'll go Volk, Urid, Hethos, uh, Dickrow, and then Gren, our Grenadine friend. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go Hephos, then Volk, then Dishro, then Urid, and then uh, Gren, with the notion that Urid is sort of a free agent floating meme tier card, where it's not necessarily fair to put it in the list of five, because it's not necessarily doing the same role as the other four cards in the cycle. Uh, but yeah, so that that's my list, that's Sunny's list. Sunny doesn't care about ranking things, but I know listeners like ranking things. Look, this is the internet, people love numbered lists, Sunny. We should make numbered lists more. The feedback's gonna be, why don't we have more numbered lists from FECast? I want the numbered lists! Yeah, let's 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 stoop to that level of clickbait. Like when websites would put out their tier lists, I was a very vocal opponent against it because I thought it was silly to tier something like oh, Eternal yeah. that's so rock paper scissors y, um, oh, yeah. where you know like new tech can pop up at any time in order to swing a matchup one way. I guess markets have changed that uh, quite a bit, but. I am a notable like anti fun person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think I, I, I think I think I think I think ranking thing is like these five are amusing because you know they're also very context dependent, right? It's possible, although exceptionally unlikely, that you know Gren might be the quote unquote best one if it had you know the best deck, right? If there was somehow you know the amazing support, it, you know if there was a card that was like you know. Your Grenadine didn't get plus five, plus five or something. Obviously, Gren would suddenly look a lot better. There's sort of context dependency here. I think ranking things can be kind of fun. As long as you're that, you know, it's all in good fun, that they don't really mean as much as, like, understanding why a card might be good or, you know, what situation you might want to play it in. I will say, the one reason that Volk is so good, just going back to it, is that it's, is it, it's the only one that has, like, you know, two relevant types. Although, I guess Gren also has two relevant types. Gren has the cultist tag, which... It's weird because it doesn't give cultists plus one attack either. It's only Grenadin. It's only Grenadin. But um, yeah, Volk, Volk having two relevant tags is is probably very relevant on it. You know, you you convinced me Volk. I thought was gonna be good, but like talking about it with you, I realized that it's probably even better than I thought it was. Well, that's how I feel about Urid. Like I thought Urid, uh, maybe it's got a high payoff. But looking at it a little more closely, seeing that the buffs are permanent, and realizing that you know there is some support for it already. Okay, can I tell you the worst deck that Volk is going to be a part of? And by worst, I mean, I'm hoping it's bad, but it's going to be very funny to see. Batteries has a plan to build five faction rats. Because <laughs> it's a unit that dies and makes a relic, you see? And that means rat cage. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess so. That is, that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. <laughs> you're going to play Lethrite Hideaway on turn two, and then you're going to play Volk on turn three. Somehow. <laughs> All right, let's wrap things up. Uh, we're going to get a set next week. By this time next week, we'll probably have a cast ready for you just about when the set drops. Um, hopefully, we'll have an OP announcement. I've been working on the team league that I've been trying to conceive of. Uh, details will come you know, when we get an announcement because I want to make sure that we have that information before making my plans for how this team league is going to work. But I'm excited about that. And yeah, that's about it. Any last words, Stormblast? Just keep an eye out for next week. Probably uh, if all the spoilers come out before the set is released, maybe we'll do a cast earlier. But based on how Darwolf usually does things, uh, I wouldn't expect another FE cast before next Thursday because I'd really like to, you know, review all the remaining cards in the set, right? If we, you know, yeah. if they leave one card unspoiled and it's the best card in the set, then oops. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. I actually have that day off, the day that it comes out off. Oh, so cool. uh, I might... Uh... Fire up the stream. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but definitely uh, excited to see the rest of the cards and talk about them. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to our generous patrons. Prewebin, Cotillion, Work Done Sun, Chrissier, Yeast Out, D-Dub, and Camomilk. Thank you for your continued support in these trying times. And uh, thank you to our editor, SRFS, for always making uh, FE casts easy for us to make and accessible for the masses. So uh, yeah, thank you all. And until next time, we will see you in the friend zone. The friends of eternal discord is the best place on the internet to get better at eternal. 
we have players of all skill and experience levels all happy to help each other out on basically any aspect of their eternal gameplay. And making all this possible is our generous patrons over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to support FECast or Friends of Eternal, consider donating at Patreon.com slash Friends of Eternal. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, we'll see you in the Friends Zone.